Let's turn to the first chapter of John this morning. John 1, verses 1 through 18. We're going to think about great grace. I was never much into the Greek philosophers, but I do remember that mournful complaint that Plato offered once when he said, Oh, that there might come a word from God to make all things clear. Well, that word came. <laughs> That's what John 1 is all about. The word came, and it, he, he came in flesh and blood, and he made things very clear. And uh, throughout his life, uh, he made clear that we're all sinners. And throughout his life and ministry, he made clear that only he can save us from our sin. Father, we thank you for your word, and we rejoice that it never returns void. And so make things clear for us this morning. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see what, what uh, is the magnificent truth of the incarnation of the Son of God who became flesh and tabernacled among us. Come into our hearts, uh, Lord Jesus, just as, as you came into the world. Uh, open our hearts to receive you and to receive with meekness the engrafted word of truth. For we ask this in Jesus' name, for his sake. Amen. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light for all that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, <clears throat> full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. I am sure that we agree that things are not always as they seem. Things are not always as they appear to us. We see this and we see that and we connect the dots and we draw conclusions and sometimes we're terribly wrong. Sometimes we're embarrassed. Case in point, thanks to Walt Valentine. This must be Walt Valentine's Sunday today. <laughs> the driver stopped, even though he could have made it through the intersection. The tailgating woman driver behind him was furious. She screamed, honked her horn repeatedly, made not-so-friendly gestures, dropped her cell phone and makeup. Then she heard a tap on her window, turned to see a very serious policeman standing by her car. He ordered her to exit the car with her hands on her head. Then he took her to the police station, where she was fingerprinted, photographed, and placed in a holding cell. After several hours, <clears throat> she was finally taken back to the booking desk, where the arresting officer was waiting with her personal belongings. He apologized profusely. He said, I made a terrible mistake. I pulled up behind your car while you were blowing your horn, making obscene gestures, 
and cussing a blue streak. I noticed the what would Jesus do bumper sticker on your car. <laughs> Along with the choose life license plate holder. Along with the <clears throat> follow me to Sunday school bumper sticker. And the chrome plated Christian fish emblem on the trunk. So naturally, I assumed you had stolen the car. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Walt. You've made an impact this morning. <laughs> Was this you by any chance? <laughs> Stories like that give all of us pause, I suspect. Things are not always as they seem, and so it could be said and should be said about the incarnation of the Son of God. It was not what it seemed. And so let's think about great grace this morning, his grace in coming, his grace in giving, and his grace in saving. First, his grace in coming. Verse 9, the true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt, it means tabernacled among us, and we've seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. My point here is that he came into this world not looking like the Messiah. Now you may ask, what does a Messiah look like? I don't know, but I don't think it looked like that. Because he came in grace, and he came in humility. And he condescended to be born of a woman. What does Paul say in Philippians 2? He emptied himself. He didn't regard equality with God something to be grasped, but uh, became a servant, uh, born of a woman, uh, became of no reputation, etc. Is that what a Messiah is supposed to look like? I like the larger catechism, which we don't often pay much attention to, but <clears throat> listen carefully. Christ humbled himself in his conception and birth in that being from all eternity the Son of God in the bosom of the Father, he was pleased in the fullness of time to become the Son of Man, made of a woman of low estate, and to be born of her with various circumstances of more than ordinary abasement. Think about those four words. It's a great understatement. More than ordinary abasement. Turn it into positive, let's say, extraordinary abasement. This was the eternal Son of God who left his home, his his palace, his glory, his majesty, that place of purity and perfection to come to a dark, diseased, deadly, sinful world. And there wasn't any place for him in the beginning. And there wasn't any place at the end. He started in a manger, he ended on a cross, and in between he had no place to lay his head more than ordinary abasement. To come and suffer, as he said, I believe, among a faithless and perverse generation. This was the Son of God. Extraordinary grace and humility and condescending to become one of us. His humanity, as Heath uh, emphasized earlier. And so it's no wonder that the world didn't know him. Verse 10, he was in the world, walked among us, talked among us, healed among us. He was in the world, the world was made through him, yet the world didn't know him. I like the old New International Version which says the world didn't recognize him because he simply didn't look like people thought a Messiah ought to look. 
I was a, always a fan of Queen Elizabeth. And you may have seen this story that came out after her death, where she was out hiking in the, the hills around her, her uh, castle in Scotland. And two American tourists happened to be hiking nearby as well, and they saw Queen Elizabeth with her royal protection officer, a man named Richard Griffin. But they didn't recognize the queen. She's just in hiking clothes. And so the, the, uh, the tourists approach, and uh, one asked her if she knew where the queen lived. <clears throat> she said, that the queen lived in London, but had a holiday home nearby. And so the tourist then asked if she had ever met the queen. <laughs> and she said, I haven't, but Dick here meets her regularly. <laughs> so the tourist immediately forgot about the queen, turned all his attention to the tourist, I mean to, the, to Mr. Griffin. And... Uh, and asked what the queen was like. And Mr. Griffin said, oh, he, she can be very cantankerous at times, but she's got a lovely sense of humor. And the queen just silently played along. And the tourist was just ecstatic. He was just so overjoyed. He pulled out his camera, handed it to the queen, and asked the queen to take a picture of him with Mr. Griffin. So she did, <laughs> she did. And then Mr. Griffin took the camera and he took a picture of the queen with the two tourists without offering any rationale whatsoever. And sometime later, the queen said, I'd love to be a fly on the wall when those photographs are shown to friends in America. <laughs> Hopefully someone tells him who I am. <laughs> Jesus didn't play any tricks. They just frankly didn't recognize him because he came in such grace, such humility, grace in coming. And second, we see his grace in giving. Verse 12, <clears throat> but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. What does he give us? He gives us, all those who receive him, the, the divine prerogative, the divine claim, the divine right to say, I'm a son of God. I'm a, I'm a daughter of God. To be that and to remain that forever. And so Paul says in Romans 8, I believe it is, that we've received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We can say that God's not just some distant deity. He's not some aloof deity. He's our father. He's our daddy. And it's a term of affection and uh, endearment. And uh, so we read that the Spirit of God bears witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. And if, if children, then heirs. And, and heirs with Christ. Peter says we, we've got a great inheritance. It can never perish, spoil, or fade away. And the Apostle John uh, writes in his letter with, with astonishment. He says, behold. We can just read over that word, behold. Behold what manner of love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called sons of God and daughters of God, children of God. No one can take that from us. If we receive him, I think uh, all of our grandchildren, some of them are here this morning, all of them had their school plays here in the last 10 days. And uh, with Kristen on the sideline for part of that time, I was under orders to go to those plays. So I've seen, not plays, but, you know, programs, Christmas programs. So I've seen a lot, a lot of of programs here of late. And you know what's really interesting about those programs? It's the parents. They're as entertaining to watch as the kids. <laughs> because there may be 300 or 500 kids up on that stage, 
but mom and dad, they're looking for one. And they'll wave, <laughs> and they'll blow kisses, and they give thumbs up, and they'll do like this. And when little Johnny or Susie finally finds their mom or dad out there, and they wave back, oh, the hearts of the parents just melt. And it's really a wonderful picture of the love of God for us, his sons and daughters. He can do what we can't do. He can look at each one of us as though we are his only child. And we are to behold what manner of love he's lavished upon us, that we, we are and always will be his family his sons, his daughter, he knows the number of hairs on our heads and we're the apple of his eye and, and he, his heart delights in us. Zephaniah says he exalts over us with singing. Imagine God singing over us. I mean, the parents may they blow kisses and, and wave, but he sings over us. And our names are engraved on the palms of his hands. Isn't it a lovely picture of how we can rightfully claim our place in the family and our seat at the table and our inheritance that will never pass away. That's what he's given us. So we see his grace in coming and his grace in giving and finally, his grace in saving, saving us, verse 16. And from his fullness, and that's a nice word, fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. That's a beautiful verse. You know what it's saying is he's, he's full. <laughs> he's got a lot of it, a lot of grace. And what's implied is that we need it. That we've got sin upon sin <laughs> upon sin upon sin. But where sin increased, Paul says, grace increased all the more. Where sin abounded, grace superabounded. And from his fullness, we who need it, we who are sick and need a doctor, we who are sinful and need a Savior, have received grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. The former Methodists that are among us will appreciate the words of Charles Wesley. Plenteous grace with thee is found, grace to cover all my sin. Just and holy is thy name. I am all unrighteousness, false and full of sin. I am. We've got our fullness too. <laughs> full of sin, I am. Thou art full of truth and grace. He wrote another great hymn, And Can It Be? And in the refrain of that hymn, he speaks of the mercy of God as immense and free and found out me. William Cooper wrote, there is a fountain half filled with blood. Can't sing that, <laughs> can you? It doesn't work. There's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that trickle you can't sing that either. Sinners plunge beneath that flood. Lose every one of their guilty stains. Grace upon grace. I think we often overlook this concept of fullness in the Bible. But it's there. The fullness of God and how it manifests itself time and time again. What was the promised land supposed to be like? If you think way back. A land flowing with milk and honey, right? And we read from uh, Jeremiah, that 
wonderful passage earlier where the people of God will shout for joy on the heights and rejoice over the bounty of the Lord and celebrate His goodness and languish no more because of the abundance of the new wine and the grain and the oil. The wine's often in the Bible a symbol of His goodness, of His provision for His people. Malachi didn't mention wine, but he mentioned God one day opening the windows of heaven and pouring out so much blessing there's not enough room to receive it all. When Jacob blessed Judah, he forecast a day when there would be so much wine, such an abundance of wine, the people would wash their clothes in it. The prophet Amos spoke of the day when the wine would be so abundant it would, it would uh, drip from the mountains and flow down the hills. When you come to the New Testament, you find the Lord feeding 5,000 people. Now, of course, we know that he really only fed 4,990 because the biblical writers are like us. They just, they just round up the numbers. It's so much easier to say 5,000, isn't it, rather than 4,990. But those poor 10 people, they got left out. What a shame. What a goofy preacher you're listening to right now. He fed 5,000 and there were leftovers, Right? And when Jesus turned water to wine, did his first miracle in Cana of Galilee, there were these gigantic stone jars, six of them, I believe, capacity of 20 to 30 gallons. And he said, fill them up halfway. I'm checking you now. <laughs> fill them to the brim, he said. You get the picture? I could go on and on. I don't, don't mean to belabor the point. But from his fullness, we've received grace upon grace. He's not frugal. He's not stingy. You ever think you've, you're too far gone? You've blown it. You're beyond the reach of God's grace. He doesn't think that way. He's not like us. We say, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? He doesn't ask that question. From his fullness, we've received grace upon grace. Charles Spurgeon, Heath and I both mention frequently because we, we like him. He was known as the Prince of Preachers and young man immensely gifted, tireless servant who did more than just preach, started orphanages and publications and so forth, but he was prone to depression. And one particularly bad day, uh, he was walking home, and he remembered the verse that says, my grace is sufficient for you. And he imagined a little fish swimming in the River Thames, saying to himself, my goodness, I better stop drinking this water or I'll drink the river dry. And God said, little fish, drink away. And then he imagined a little mouse in the granaries of Joseph in Egypt saying he better stop eating lest he eat it all. But God said, little mouse, eat away. And then he imagined himself as a mountain climber saying, I better stop breathing all this air lest I use it all up. But God said, little man, breathe away. And for the first time in his life, Spurgeon says he felt a freedom and a confidence and an assurance that the Father is truly all-sufficient. From his fullness, we receive grace upon grace. A man would have to be as a, a fool to turn his back on this. And so John Gerstner said, why die of thirst in the middle of an ocean of grace? Father, we thank you for your ocean of grace from your fullness. We thank you for your bounty. We thank you for making this word so clear 
the Word became flesh and came to save us from our sin. And we thank you that, that your mercy is immense and free and inexhaustible. And we call on you once again for still more mercy and still more grace. Bless us, Lord, and help us. Rid us of uh, the sin that so easily besets us. Set us free to run with endurance the race that you've set out for us. Looking to the Lord Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, the one who manifested his grace in coming, his grace in giving us the right to become sons of God and his amazing grace in saving us from our many sins. Bless us, we pray, and help us to serve you faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen.